Hey, everybody, welcome to the Gym Master Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Talk Show Series. How are all of you? It's good to see your smiley faces. Nice to have you here on a Wednesday, hump day, as they say. <laughs> Got an audience that's international. We welcome you from wherever you're watching. Again, we always say that this Entertainment Lifestyle Talk Show Series is, is welcoming to everybody, regardless of your income, your zip code, your height, your weight, your eye color, your religious or political views. You're all welcome here to experience what we deliver every single night. We started this show back in uh, late April, early May of last year, and we are approaching somewhere over 400 live episodes seven days a week, which really is extraordinary. And we thank you and you and you and everybody who has been really watching and tagging and celebrating and supporting the show. We've created something really special here. We have guests that come in from Broadway and Hollywood, television, film, music, sports, comedy, culinary arts, inspiration, and just life in general. And what this show really is about is sort of harkening back to the old school talk shows with the legendary TV hosts like Carson and Dick Cavett and Dick Clark and uh, Merv Griffin, Mike Douglas, you know, warm conversational styles, bringing in the viewers from around the world, but at the same time with a modern vibe and a modern twist. So we launched this uh, as an extension of my uh, professional work as a television and radio host, presenter, journalist, uh, personality, voiceover artist, stage MC, narrator, writer, producer. And uh, back in the springtime of last year, we brought in the television lights and uh, built the home studio here. And the rest has been history. And you guys are amazing. You're so active all the time, posting on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and Periscope and Twitch and everywhere else about how much you love the show. You guys are chatting with each other. We also have that Facebook group that we started that you guys wanted. It's called JMS Live Lovety Hall. And you'll hear that word lovety bantered around a lot because in the summertime, if you're new to our show, I'll tell you briefly what happened. I was saying, you know, we're looking for positive energy, positive vibes, right? Especially during what we've experienced in the last 12 months or so, positivity has been paramount. So I just happened to have a Freudian slip and I said light love and levity. And I said love and levity a little too fast and out came lovety. And as soon as I said that word, everybody attached themselves to it and it's become sort of branding for our show. And then everybody says, Jim, that wasn't an accident. That was meant to be. So you guys, the viewers, call yourselves the Loveties, and I think that's very cool. You call me Mr. Lovety, and I think yeah, that's not too bad as well. And you call this Lovety Hall and you're part of our Lovety Squad. I think it's really awesome what we've done here. And thanks again for everybody who tunes in, watches. A lot of you watch live and you comment during the show. I'm a very viewer centric host. So all the comments coming in, keep them coming. Uh, but a lot of you also watch later on and you watch in our archives, which I think is really cool. If you want to see this episode again or any of the episodes of the Gym Master Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Talk Show series, you can see them all right there on our YouTube channel, 24 7, 365. We have uh, close to 400 or so episodes there for the uh, the taking and the watching and the sharing and the enjoying. So be sure and check out some of the other guests. We have uh, inspiring conversations, amazing guests, lots of levity and lots of surprises on the show as well. So it's cool to have everybody here today. And of course, as we always say, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, which is Jim Masters TV. In addition to this series, we also have a positive uh, short video series called Masters Mantras. I've been doing these positive mantras for a long time on Facebook. So I transferred some of those over to the YouTube channel and you can see some of them. I guess they're sort of like short TikTok videos, but not necessarily in that vein. They're short visual and verbal inspirational videos with nice scenes and things of that nature. So you can check that out and again, subscribe. Don't forget to uh, click that notification bell as well so you don't miss any of the incredible content we have on the channel for you, Gym Masters TV. We have an amazing guest that's gonna be joining us uh, momentarily. I know you guys are very excited, as am I. Tennis star, ESPN tennis commentator, Patrick Macro is joining us live and direct from New York. We've got a great conversation in store. We're very happy to have him here. He's gonna be joining us in just a second. And what's really cool, and he's 
might even give us a little bit tour of where he is. He's at the actual tennis academy, the John McEnroe Tennis Academy, and uh, and you know the kids are playing. Everybody's there doing their thing, and we're gonna get a little behind the scenes sneak peek exclusively on our show a little bit later in the conversation. But first, we welcome everybody. This mug came in from Nova Scotia, Canada from the wonderful Karen Campbell Green, one of our lovely viewers. It says, kind, generous, supportive you. Really a beautiful gift and a very kind and generous thing to send, Karen. I know you watch all the time. So we thank you. We just have a little uh, Trader Joe's uh, green tea in there. <laughs> Let's check in quickly with some of our lovely viewers. Again, we have an international audience who joins us every single night live, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, to, uh, to welcome the experience of the Gym Master Show Live. Like Willie, who's watching in Holland, she goes, uh, hello, everybody. Sends in those tulips as well. Thanks for joining us, Willie. I know it's like 1 a.m. where you are in the Netherlands, so you are a trooper. We welcome you, of course. Subscribe to that YouTube channel. Hello to all the loveties that are watching. Uh, Merlin is watching in Canada, in her Kip, Ontario. Hello, Jim and loveties. Uh, let's try this again. Heavy thunderstorms last night. Yeah, you had some rough weather in Ontario, right? It sort of knocked out your Wi-Fi, but we're happy that you're here tonight. Merlin in Canada. Kathy Short is watching in Cleveland, Ohio. Hello, Jim and loveties. So nice to see everyone tonight. Uh, just so you know, Patrick knows all about the Lovety situation because his wife, uh, Melissa Rico, was with us, <laughs> you know, the Broadway star. Uh, that's his wife, yes. And um, she was brilliant. She was amazing. We had so much fun in that episode, didn't we? So uh, he was watching. You may remember he commented during the show as well. And he said he was looking forward to popping on the Gym Master Show live tonight and uh, to have fun with all the loveties. So he, he's he got the whole lovety thing down. <laughs> Mary Bishop is watching in Florida. Hello, Jim and lovety friends. Good to see you, Mary, in Pine Island, Florida. That's really cool when you tune in. Claudia Bartow is here. Hello, everyone. Uh, Anne is watching in Southern California. Hello and happy Wednesday. So happy uh, to see all your amazing loveties. Good to see you, Anne. Crystal Nolan is watching in Connecticut. Uh, hi, Jim and everyone. Happy Wednesday. Good to see you as well. Juanita is watching in South Africa, where she watches every single day. She never misses an episode. Hello, Jim and Lovety Squad. Great to see everyone. That's cool. It's good to see you as well, because I know it's almost tomorrow, if not already tomorrow in South Africa, isn't it? Uh, Crystal says, hi, Jim and everyone. Happy Wednesday. Hope you're having a fantastic day. Looking forward to an exciting show, an inspiring conversation, and of course, the famous Lovety. Jennifer Barry is here from Allentown, Pennsylvania. Hi, Jim and Lovities. And of course, our wonderful guest, Patrick Macaro. I got Wi-Fi internet. I'm back. <laughs> yeah, I know sometimes the Wi-Fi deep in those mountains of uh, Allentown, Pennsylvania can get a little rough there. Ann Wozniak in Jacksonville, Florida. She says, hi, Jim and everyone. Hope you're uh, enjoying this wonderful Wednesday. We sure are. We love it. And uh, I love how everybody says hello to each other, too. That's really, really cool. Merlin in Canada is welcoming Patrick to Lovety Hall. He's now a Lovety. He, he's excited about that. <laughs> you know, he's won a lot of awards. He's worked hard in his career, but he's a Lovety now in the Gym Master Show life. So I think, uh, you know, he's all set now. <laughs> Game, set, match. Uh, greetings, Jim and Lovety uh, friends, and welcome, Patrick, to JMS Live tonight. You are now a Lovety. Happy you could be with us. And that's Christine Clifton watching in North Carolina. And uh, Claudia says, hello, Jim, and hope you have been well. We are doing splendidly here. Everybody's doing well. Jennifer says, hi, Patrick, as well. So again, we've got an amazing guest. Um, he has had a dual life in terms of a wonderful tennis career, but also a uh, really, really prolific broadcaster and a really skilled broadcaster. Um, you know, I've always enjoyed watching people that are in the same business as myself and really appreciate people who do the right thing in terms of just really appreciating, you know, some of the old school people who pave the way, uh, some of the legends, and then, you know, people who have class and finesse and polish and, but they're authentic and they're real on the air as well. And that's Patrick. And you may see Patrick uh, oftentimes broadcasting alongside his uh, his partner, who is his brother, John. Yes, John Macaro is his brother. And they always have a great time. And uh, he's been on 
air for a long time, Patrick, longer than most people even probably realize, and ESPN and USA and, and others over the years. And it's really exciting to have an opportunity to chat with him tonight. Again, he's at the Tennis Academy, which I think is really cool. And we're going to check that out in just a second. First, let me tell you a little bit about his incredible background. Again, I'm sure you know, but uh, American former professional tennis player, broadcaster, former captain of the United States Davis Cup team, uh, born in New York, of course, John McEnroe's youngest brother, won singles title, that is, and 16 double titles, say that five times fast, including the 1989 French Open. His career high rankings were world number 28 in singles and world number three in uh, doubles. He comes from, obviously, a tennis family, as you know. He started playing as a young boy and was taught at the Port Washington Tennis Academy, where his brother John also played. And as a junior, Patrick reached the semifinals of Wimbledon and the U.S. Open boys singles in 83. He partnered with Luke Jensen to win the French junior doubles and the USTA boys 18 national clay court titles in 1984. He also made his first impact on the professional tour that year, teaming up with his brother John to win the doubles title at Richmond, Virginia. He won the men's double gold medal at the 1987 Pan American Games with Jensen and helped Stanford University win the NCAA team championship in 86 and 88. And while at Stanford, he was a member of the uh, Sigma Alpha Epsilon fraternity. He graduated from Stanford in 88 with a degree in political science and then joined the professional tennis tour. In 89, he won the French Open men's double title and the master's double title, partnering with Jim Grab as well. To go to talk more about his incredible career, um, he really is just an all around great guy. And again, he's a family man too. You know, he's a husband, he's a father, um, and one of his daughters is uh, involved in tennis. And we're going to talk about that and so much more. But let's welcome him live and direct from New York, the one and only Patrick McEnroe. Hey, Patrick, welcome to the show. It's good to have uh, you with I'm, us. I'm telling you, Jim, I mean, you'd never take a night off. I mean, seven days a week. It's absolutely <laughs> amazing that you keep doing it every night. I've seen the show, as you said, I. My beautiful wife, Melissa, was on the show, and I said, I got to get on the show. Give me an in here. And you, you, I got to say, Jim, not only did you do your homework on me, okay, pulling up some of those nuggets, you are the first person that's ever interviewed me. And I've been interviewed a few times in my life in, uh, over my career that ever mentioned my fraternity at Stanford. So, I mean, See? you're all over it, my friend. Great to be so on, and I officially feel like a lovety now. I'm so lucky. <laughs> I'm a lucky lovety. <laughs> so uh, Melissa told you about all that, I'm sure. But you were watching that night, too, and you were chiming in, which I think was really cool. And uh, <laughs> Mary uh, welcomes you. She goes, hi, Patrick, and welcome. And Juanita, who's watching all the way in South Africa, where it's just it's about tomorrow, says, welcome to the show, Patrick. And Kathy Short in Cleveland. Hello, Patrick. So nice to have you on the show tonight. And uh, Maureen's watching in Arizona. She works in the healthcare industry. She rushes home to never miss our show there in Arizona. Welcome, Patrick, to Lovely Hall. How exciting to have you here with us, Patrick. And Crystal in Connecticut. Uh, this is the Lovely Wave, Patrick. Uh, hi, Patrick. Welcome to uh, Lovely I Hall. Love Jennifer in Pennsylvania says, uh, hi, Patrick, and Christine Clifton, North Carolina. Greetings, Jim and lovely friends. Welcome, Patrick, to the show. You're now a lovety. Happy you could be with us uh, as well. So, and uh, it is a real honor and pleasure to have you here. I know you're very busy. You've got a lot going on. You're there at the uh, the Academy, right? Yeah, I've been here. I've been here all day. Actually, this morning, Jim, I was in Central Park where there's an event at the Central Park Tennis Courts where I used to play years ago when I was on the tour. Uh, to raise money for the Central Park Conservancy. So uh, some of the ladies that play here at our tennis academy uh, asked me to stop by. It was like gorgeous. As I'm, I'm a little sunburned. Melissa's going to be upset with me because I didn't bring my sunscreen. I didn't think, wow, I couldn't believe it was so gorgeous out. So I spent a couple hours out there at, the, at Central Park, which, uh, of course, is always amazing. And it's great to feel the vibe that, you know, people are out and about. And I, I, I always have my mask with me. But when I'm out now, now it's official. I'm by the way, Jim, I'm totally vaxxed, totally relaxed, okay? So I got the double shot. I'm all good to go. So I was walking around Central Park after I went to the tennis courts, you know, did my little walk around the reservoir, which I used to run. Now I walk. 
Um, and it was great to see so many people out and about and a little energy in the city, which, of course, in the Broadway world, which you and your your lovety listeners know too well. I know well because of my beautiful wife, Melissa. Boy, that whole, you know, driving through Times Square, as I've done many times in the Broadway, I mean, it's like such a bummer. It's just yeah. a total bummer. So, uh, yeah. you know, hopefully we're starting to see some signs that um, the world you're in, you know, the musical theater world, the cabaret world, world the nightclub world and so on can start to come back so i'm very excited because melissa is actually preparing to do a show at fiop the french institute she's done a couple of uh, live streams already with adam gopnik the great writer from the new yorker this they're doing a third in a series um and this is on the film noir uh mm. movies um the great film noir movie so adam's gonna sort of tell us some stories and some interesting tidbits about them and melissa will sing some songs but they're doing it in the theater for the first wow. time, they're going to live stream it as well. It's on May 6th, but also she's going to actually be in the theater. It's going to be uh, some people there in the crowd, obviously fairly small, but at least it's a start. And so I'm very happy to see that, you know, headed in the right direction. That is really cool. And that's exciting news, my friend. Thanks for uh, sharing that. And we'll keep an eye out for all of that. So she must be really happy and stoked and excited that things are starting to roll out and open up as we all do what we need to do to make it happen, right? Absolutely. I mean, she actually went um, into the city and went to get uh, a look, looking for a dress, you know, because like, oh, I'm so excited. I get to get a dress, you know, used to go and do it, all <laughs> right. the Broadway shows. So Eric Winterling, who's a famous, um, uh, uh, makes the dresses for a lot of big Broadway shows. Uh, she went to see him. And anyway, she's turned it into what's going to be a whole story in the New York Times. You know, she's written about five pieces and to the New York Times. Um, and this one's going to be sort of about that world, that community dealing with what's happened in the last year and a half. Obviously the relationship of an actor and actress with the person who's making the dress. So that's a very personal type thing. Um, right. But also just overall people in that business, you know, finally having something to do. Oh, I can actually make a dress for a human being. Um, right. So again, she's very excited about it. And uh, I know, you know, the Broadway community is starting to at least see flickers of hope that um, the shows can come back. Hopefully, hopefully we'll see some by the end of the year. That is really, really cool. So how have you been, Patrick? Uh, obviously, it's been a really unusual year. It's been unprecedented really for all of us. And, you know, even working in the broadcast industry, as, as I do and you do as well, uh, I know in studios I've been in, PBS and elsewhere, you know, skeletal crews and, mm -hmm. and not able to really do the on location shoots and different stuff like normally we would. Um, how have you been able to adapt? And you even had a touch back in the spring, I think, of, of the COVID yes. and sailed through. Uh, what was that experience like for you, Patrick? Well, I, I actually got it very early on in er, in mid March of uh, 2020. So it was I was one of the first people, sort of in the New York area, to get it where we live in Westchester. And of course, at that at that time, I mean, we still are learning, obviously, a lot about it. But at that time, we were really in the dark. I mean, I, it took me days and days just to be able to get a test, to book a test. Um, the doctors, you know, really didn't quite know exactly how to treat. I'll take some Tylenol, do whatever you do. Don't go to the hospital, you know, stay in your basement. So that's that's what we did. And as you said, luckily, I didn't have a very serious bout with COVID. I was a little bit under the weather, a little bit fatigued. I had a fever, but not a serious one for a couple of days. And Melissa was amazing, you know, setting me up in our basement, bringing me food. We blocked off the uh, area in the basement. We luckily have an area where, you know, to pull out sofa beds so I could sleep down there. I could even sneak outside because there's a doorway that goes outside with the dog and take a walk in the fresh air, um, obviously away from everybody. Uh, so it was, it was pretty bizarre, uh, obviously, what happened. And as far as the, the broadcast world, Jim, I usually travel all the time, you know, going yeah. to big tournaments all over the world. Um, and I have been on a one flight uh, to Florida and back in the last over a year and a half. And that was mm. to see my daughter, who was actually down there uh, playing tennis. Yeah. So I went down there to see her and then brought her home. Um, and so the, uh, the, the tournament in London, which is at the end of last year, we normally go to London. This is called the ATP Finals. And then the Australian Open, which is a big Grand Slam event, which actually happened in Australia um, <clears throat> this February. We, uh, we, I went to the ESPN headquarters up in Connecticut. 
So like yes. you said, we went there, we went there was our, our most of our team went there and we had to sort of pseudo quarantine in a, in a local hotel. But like you said, I mean, the, normally there's thousands of people on the campus at ESPN. And I believe the number they gave us, there was like 125. I mean, bizarre. Yeah. OK, uh, somehow we, you know, credit to ESPN and the technical crew for pulling it off and, you know, bringing in the, 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 the tennis from Australia. So we were able to do it and, and do it very well. But uh, obviously very different. I just got off a phone call with our ESPN team about the plans for Wimbledon which, as you know, was completely canceled last year, yeah. which had never happened since World War II. So Wimbledon is going to happen this year. They're doing quite well in the UK with the vaccine. They're slowly starting to open up. And in fact, by I think they're supposed to completely open mid-June. They're starting to, you know, they're do, taking it in steps. Um, but Wimbledon is going to happen. And so it looks like us, our team at ESPN, there's a decent chance we'll actually be going to London to cover the tournament, a, a scaled down version of what we normally do. So obviously a lot of things have to happen before that takes place. And of course, things have to continue to move in the right direction as far as the pandemic goes. But again, the, and the, you know, professional tennis really thrives on the fans and the ticket sales day to day. A little bit like, you know, the, the, the a big Broadway show, you know, they only make money if, if they're selling out every day. You know, if yeah. people are coming every day to see the show because of the cost of keeping up the show. In tennis, it's similar because, you know, they only run the Grand Slam for two weeks of the year. They obviously have to have these amazing facilities, put a lot of money into putting the event on. Right. And the, the, the television revenue is not as big in tennis as it is in some of the major team sports. So tennis really relies on that day-to-day -day gate of people coming through, hospitality, and so on. So professional tennis has really suffered in that yeah. way in the last year. Recreational tennis, which is part of what I do here at the Tennis Academy, along with high level junior players, has thrived because tennis is very easy to, to physically distance and still play and still get a workout and still be completely safe. So I've been out on the court teaching lessons and working with kids and adults since May of last year. Uh, and, and for the tennis business, it's been, uh, it's been very positive. Now, hopefully, that will continue once the pandemic ends. But um, it's been very, very good for the tennis business as a whole because tennis is one of those sports that can safely be played from a distance and indoors as well because we've been doing a lot of indoor tennis here at our academy this entire past six to nine months. I'd love, and that's fantastic. And it's great that that academy is there and, you know, is available and it's just been keeping, you know, this positive spirit, which has something that everybody has certainly needed through everything we've been going through. Um, I want to talk about the, you know, being a television radio guy myself, I want to talk about the broadcasting part of what you do, because it's fascinating to me, but let's talk, let's go back in time to uh, your youth and some of the inspirations in your life, obviously, you know, your parents, your brother, um, what was the interest and the first germ of inspiration for tennis within the family? Where do you think that initially came from? Well, I know where it came from, Jim, because it's interesting, my parents didn't play tennis at all. You know, my mom grew up in, in Long Island, uh, my dad grew up uh, an only child in New York City of Irish. His parents were Irish immigrants. So neither of them really had a lot growing up um, as far as opportunities. But they met early. They met actually when my mom was in nursing school in New York City. And my dad was already completed, was in law school, was actually working part time. Uh, anyway, fast forward to when they were married and had John, their, their first child. I have another brother named Mark, who's also right. a bit older than me. So I was the youngest. So when my dad kind of made it as a lawyer, he became a, an attorney, <clears throat> excuse me, an attorney. And when he made it as a partner at a law firm, a big law firm he worked at for years and years in New York called Paul Weiss, my parents, you know, moved from their apartment in Flushing, Queens. You know, they moved to a town called Douglaston. And then oh, yeah. they moved to the part of Douglaston, which sort of like the fancier side, which is called Douglas Manor. And in Douglas Manor, there's a little small club called the Douglaston Club. And so my parents became members of the club. And John was about nine years old. And John was very athletic, you know, loved to play soccer, loved to play basketball. It was just a great 
all around athlete, but he never played tennis. Mm. So we went to the local club and you could either choose swimming because they had a swimming pool or a little sailing thing because it's on the bay right there. Right. Uh, and he's like, no, he didn't like any of that. He liked sports. So he tried tennis. So uh, he started playing at the local club and there was a college kid there who was who was kind of running the program. He was a college tennis player. It was just like his summer job. So after about a month, Jim, the college kid came to my parents and he said, you know, you realize that your son has like ridiculous hand-eye coordination. Like, you, has he ever played tennis? It's like, no, he never played tennis in his life. And, and by the way, starting tennis at nine is yeah. actually quite old to become a high level, not even just a high level professional player, a high level player, period. Right. So that's when my the, the coach said to my parents, you should take him, you mentioned it in your open, to the Port Washington Tennis Academy, which in those days was really the only sort of big time academy for tennis, it was sort of a first of its kind. Now they're all over the world, in Spain and Europe and Florida and so on. So my parents took John there and there was a famous coach named Harry Hopman who had come from Australia. And John went for a tryout. And Harry Hopman took one look at him. He said, we'll take him. He's going to be number one in the world one day. Now, of course, the other side of it, Jim, is he would say that to all the kids that yeah. came for the tryout. <laughs> but this time he happened to be right. Um, yeah. So I was, much, you know, I'm, I'm about seven years younger than John, about four years younger than my other brother, Mark. And basically, I just did whatever my brothers did. Whatever right. they did, I wanted to do, you know, whether it was play soccer, you know, go, go, go down to the, we had a little park where we go play basketball and play tennis. And we all love playing tennis, but we did like, love other sports as well. It just so happened we were a lot better at tennis. Were you, know, you guys so very you, uh, competitive yeah. with each other, like sibling rivalry? Well, we, we started playing a lot more together when I got older, because yeah. when I got to be about 17 or so, I could at least play with my brother. Now, at that point, he was already number one in the world. Right. So he would still kick my you know what. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, when I was seven, eight, you know, he was much older. So the difference was pretty extreme. I used to play with my brother Mark a lot because he was a pretty good tennis player, but he didn't become like a real competitive player. So I remember the first time I ever beat him, you know, I was like 10 and he, uh, and he was 14 and he was so pissed that I beat him. He's like, now I got my, you know, I got my older brother who's great. Now I got my little younger brother. He used to call me a little runt because I would follow him around. Um, so tennis kind of got in our blood at that young age. But again, we liked all sports. Um, yeah. We loved team sports, but we were just very competitive in the individual sport. And we happened to be very skilled at tennis. So when you are competitive, Jim, and you're an athlete, you, you lean towards the sports where you win a lot more. So we started right. to win a lot more playing tennis. So that's how we you know, stuck with it. I uh, think I did a little research and I heard that uh, when you would play John in ping pong, you were able to uh, score a little bit, huh? <laughs> yeah, we, we, had a, we had a little garage where we grew up in Douglaston that had a ping pong table in the garage. So actually that was one of the only games that I could compete with him, you know, and he... He used to get a little bit upset when I beat him. And um, we it was funny because we used to have the paddles and, and the paddles, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd throw them against the wall. And we got pissed off and the handles would break, you know, on, the, on our paddles. So we had all this masking tape that we'd re, you know, nice. tape the paddles. And my dad would be upstairs. What the hell's going on down there? <laughs> be quiet down there. So, um, so yes, we were competitive, but it was, uh, it wasn't until I got to be much older that, I could even compete with John as a tennis player. And, you know, it was always a little uncomfortable. We actually played against each other on the pro tour. He whooped, whooped my butt a couple of times. And one time we played in a fairly famous match in the finals of a tournament in Chicago when I was sort of at the peak of my game and John was sort of at the tail end, end of his career. And he, he still beat me, but it was much closer than normally it was. Um, so we didn't really like playing against each other, to be honest. I didn't have like a desire to really want to beat my brother. I looked up to my brother. Right. Um, he was, you know, very positive about me and my tennis career because I had to live in his shadow right. in a lot of ways. And I was not as good as him. I wasn't going to be as good as him, but he was number one in the world. You know, so I got to be number 28 in the world, which is pretty darn good. Um, and made a good career out of it. So he, there's a picture from the tournament in Chicago 
um, nicely done there, Jim. So you are prepared. You are the ultimate pro. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, my, it was funny because my mom, when I graduated from Stanford, uh, I actually took the board, the law board to go to law school because my dad was a lawyer. And then our brother Mark became a successful lawyer as well. And my mom was like, oh, Patrick, do you really want to be a pro tennis player? You know, you're not going to be as good as your brother. That whole she was worried about me that I wouldn't, yeah. you know, be able to handle that. And John was my number one supporter. He was like, mom, stay out of it. Patrick's yeah. going to be a really good professional tennis player. He can make a really good career and, and get off his back. So I took the law boards, Jim, yeah. literally the day after I graduated from Stanford. OK. And it wasn't great timing because I was, you know, partying at, with my buddies at Stanford. And then I said, well, I'll take the law boards. And when I got those test results back, Jim, my mom saw them and she said, son, professional tennis is for you. <laughs> <laughs> so luckily I stayed with tennis and, you know, it's given me an amazing career, even obviously after my playing days, which ended a little prematurely with some shoulder problems when I was 29, 30, but that launched my television career. And as you said, I can't believe it. I've been with ESPN now for about 25 years. Is that for ESPN. not so it's unbelievable? Been, yeah, yeah. Amazing. It's been a hell yeah. of a ride and, and, I, and I love it. You know, there's still a buzz. Like I'm sure you get doing it every night, you know, yeah. doing a show, but when the light comes on and oh, uh, yeah. you're on live TV and you're talking about something you really love, I find it um, thrilling and to be able to work with my brother as I've done in the last, you know, 10 years, especially since he came over to ESPN. It's really been one of the great um, experiences in my life to work alongside him at the Wimbledon final and the U.S. Open final and be able to branch out as a broadcaster so that I can do multiple roles. You know, that's something I always tried to do over the years was not just be the tennis analyst, but be a host be a play-by-play -play guy, be a studio guy, do my own radio show. Now I've got my own podcast. So I've always tried to sort of push myself in other directions to continue to evolve and improve. You know, it's it's amazing when you have this sort of situation, a relationship with a brother like that. And has he been a mentor? Has he been a guide? Has he been, whether it's, you know, tennis itself or in broadcasting, somebody that you've sort of relied on and he's, he's sort of like the big brother who helps out whenever he can, mentors, guides you, or is it you're, you're helping each other along the way? I think, I think, I think it's more where we're feeding off of each other, Jim. I don't, I wouldn't say that in the TV world that John, let's say as a mentor, he's extremely positive with me. Great job. You know, you're, you know, that kind of thing. He's more like a big brother, to be honest. He's really, because he knows that, I mean, I started in, in some ways, even before he did as a broadcaster, I was still playing. I mean, he became, he's Johnny Mac. So he's, he's become an amazing broadcaster, uh, arguably the, you know, the best there is. Uh, and, and so I've sort of worked my way up the totem pole over the years. Uh, and again, you know, sort of branch out into different directions and different areas. So, of course, we always support each other. But it, there's, I can't say that he said, hey, Patrick, you should do this or you should do that. It's always like, you know, we've, we've both kind of found our way, found our niche. Um, you know, we're different personalities, even though we, 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 we sound alike. In fact, ESPN had to, you know, mix match us a little bit differently because they couldn't tell the difference in our voices when we first started working together Yeah, uh, and we were doing matches together. So, um, now I think we've reached a comfort level together where I feel like we're, we, we both really thrive, you know, when we yeah. work together. So it's been great. And in fact, my podcast for this season just came out yesterday for season two it's called holding court and john was my first guest and he wasn't on all last season and i had on all sorts of ex-tennis players and athletes and uh, actors like alec baldwin and ben stiller and singers and i actually was sitting in this room in our conference room in our academy about a month or so ago and i was kind of gearing up for season two and I have my podcast machine here because I take it with me in case I got to record. It's, you know, I do it over the phone uh, because of COVID, but right. it, it hooks right into the system. So John looks at it. He came in here one day. He said, what is that? I said, that's my podcast machine. That's what I do on my podcast. He goes, man, he goes, you've done a lot of those. Not as many as, would you say, 400 shows you've done? 
700. Uh, about <laughs> how many hundred? It feels a little like 700, but it's about 400. And then that is uh, in conjunction with my professional work during right. the daytime in television and radio. Uh, but about 400, seven days yeah. away. <laughs> so, anyway, so John says to me, um, How many of those have you done? Meaning the podcast. Yeah. I said, Well, I think I did like 75 or 80 last year because I was, you know, knocking them out pretty yeah. regularly. And he says, uh, well, when am I going to get on? Yeah. So I'm like, oh, here's my chance. Because yeah, I tried. I didn't want to ask him, right? You know, because that, that's so obvious, right? Plus, I didn't want to put the arm on him. I was like, you know, I'm going to do my own thing. And he says, how about I come on for episode number 100? And I said, uh, you know what? I got even a better idea. I'm about to launch season two. And right. my plan is to do two a week. You know, one of them is on Tuesday. It's more about tennis. And the other one yeah. is a special guest, which tomorrow will be Kristen Chenoweth, by the way, the mm -hmm. famous Broadway singer. So she was amazing. So I got my brother to agree to come out with me once a month. So we kicked it off yesterday. I just told them, um, as I saw him today, the most, there he is. Look, speaking of hey. the there he is. Look hey, John, how are you? Guest appearance. He can't <laughs> hear because I got my earplugs on. <laughs> but we had, the, we had the most listeners ever in a 24-hour period. Um from his podcast with me yesterday. So we kicked off season two with a bang and I wow. uh, can't wait for everyone because I know your your fans, the Levities, will love to hear from Miss Kristen Chenoweth. She is phenomenal. So how are you enjoying uh, the broadcast career um, as opposed to being out there you know, on the courts? Uh, do you see a lot of similarities? Obviously, both require a lot of resilience, tenacity, blood, sweat, and tears. Anything can happen. You've seen it all. Uh, you know, it's not, you don't just punch the clock and you're in and out. You got to give it your all in both arenas, in tennis and in broadcasting. Well, one of the great things about tennis, okay, that what tennis teaches you at, at, at any level, whatever you play, is that you're never going to be perfect. It's not going to happen, no matter who you are. If you're Serena Williams, or Roger Federer, you know, you still miss balls, you make mistakes, and guess what? You lose a lot of matches. And so it, tennis teaches you that resilience that you're talking about, just naturally. If you want to become a really good tennis player, you have no choice but to be resilient, to learn from your mistakes, to suffer defeat, and to figure right. out how to get better. And right. obviously in, in your business and this business and the TV business, you know, the, the radio business, I mean, look, there's, there's a lot of jobs that I wanted to get that I didn't get. I mean, I see right. it with in the acting business with Melissa, you know, doing her own tapes, doing her own audition. Oh, I did a great job. Guess what? You know, I never got the call. I don't know how. I don't I didn't get the job. Why? I have no idea why. And so you have to have that same resilience. And I think the key to it, Jim, is obviously continuing to improve your skills, right, in whatever you do. But the key also is to love what you do. To right. love it, to be passionate about it. I've been lucky because I've been able to make a living in the tennis world in one way or the another for my entire adult life. Okay, but part of that is because I've taken on different challenges. I've been an administrator. I ran the USTA player development program, more of an administrative political job. As you said, I was a Davis Cup captain for 10 years dealing with the top players. Now I'm working at our tennis academy, working with people that are beginners people that are high level junior players, people that are run the gamut, you know, of, of, and being able to, to help someone learn something is a great, is, is really a great honor, to be honest, to help someone that's passionate about learning at whatever level they're, they're playing. Um, so I've been lucky, but as you said, it, I've also learned, I think a lot of life skills from tennis that's helped me in my professional life as well. Which is really, really cool. And again, when you're able to make that segue and still have the same, you know, fortitude and resilience, the same passion that you had uh, with tennis and be able to translate it into a great broadcast, a prolific broadcasting career, Patrick, it's amazing. Did you always know as a kid, did you want to be a broadcaster? Did you want to be out there reporting and commentating? Well, I love I love sports, number one, and I did love listening to the broadcasters. You know, I love uh, yeah. Pat Summerall used to do the football, oh, and yeah. he Best. and Tony Trabert and John Newcomb used to do the U.S. Open. So, uh, and then you know, Dick Vitale is a, Dick a Vitale. friend of mine actually, who yeah. was just you know his energy and enthusiasm. I wasn't a big college basketball fan, 
but I watched college basketball because of him. And then, of course, growing up in New York, you know, the great Marv Albert doing the Knicks uh, and the yeah. Ranger games. We were big fans of the Knicks and the Rangers. So when my dad got tickets to go to a Ranger game or a Nick game, we'd get on that LIRR and go into Madison Square Garden and go to a, I mean, that was a big deal for the McEnroe boys, you know, to be able to do that. Um, and then years later, you know, watching John play Bjorn Borg at Madison Square Garden, you know, at the old Masters tournament. So that was really cool. And going to concerts, you know, I used to love rock and roll and going to concerts at Garden. Um, but just love I, I love I love sports and I love yeah. television. And, uh, yeah. you know, I was used to being asked a lot of questions, Jim, because I was John's brother, like from the right. time I was 11, 12 years old when John made it big as a professional player. Um, so I would go to junior tournaments all over the country. I was one of the top junior players. That's everywhere right. I, everywhere I'd go, people wanted to interview me. What's it like being John's brother? What's it like, you know, playing? So I got used to that kind of communication. So yeah. when ESPN came to me and sort of gave me an opportunity when I was injured and recovering from a shoulder surgery, I was still trying to re rehab and play. They were looking for somebody a little younger that had just been off the tour. I jumped at the opportunity, and I think because I'd had a lot of experience in that type of environment, I was I was natural. I was a pretty I was pretty natural at it, and I loved it. I love talking about it. I love entertaining people. Uh, I love educating people about the game, um, and it was like, wow, this could actually be my career. So exactly. you know, ES, ESPN I think knew right away that that I could sort of be you know part of their team for a long time as long as they were covering tennis at that point. So I jumped at the opportunity. I, I tried to come back and play for about a year, year and a half, because I really wanted to go out on my own terms after having two shoulder surgery, because the first one yeah. didn't work. Right. Um, so that was d disappointing. But at the same time, not only did I start my broadcasting career, but I got to re-meet the one and only Melissa Errico, who, by the way, I went to grade school with. So I, we knew each other when That's we were right. kids. That's her brother right. Mike was my best friend all through grade school. So my parents, I'd kept in touch with her parents. I'd kept in touch with Mike. I remember Melissa as a young little girl. I had a little crush on her, even when she was like in kindergarten, first grade, which is weird because you know, I'm a few years older than her. I think I get more older every year, like every <laughs> 10 years. She stays um, the same. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we re-met when I'd had my shoulder injury because my parents had seen her in My Fair Lady and... Um, all the shows she'd done, you know, uh, One Touch of Venus at City Center. And they're like, you've got to meet Melissa, man. She's amazing. She's beautiful. And she's this and that. So that's how we re-met. Um, there you go. Years later. And uh, it's been over 20 years now. We've been married, three amazing daughters. And, you know, balancing, you know, sometimes we both get frustrated with our careers, right? You know, and there's our three amazing daughters. And, and, and I always say to her, you know, we we're passionate like we, we've turned our hobbies into our careers in a lot of ways but it does it does come fraught with some difficulties at times you know uh, you know uh, being a tennis player back when i used to play you know losing all the time you know losing is no fun i mean i was a successful player right. Jim, on the tour i only won one tournament in singles right. in my entire career in 10 years right. that i walked away from a tournament not having lost same yeah. as being an actor, or being a singer, you know, being a performer. You know, did I was I good? How did I do? How was the show? Why didn't I get that job? So I think we can relate to that performance side of it, and yeah. um, I think that's part of why we've been able to support each other through the ups and downs of of our careers. And you know, having that balance of of work and play and family, you both have careers that, again, you know, there's a lot of demands. There's a lot of crazy hours. Uh, she can get involved in a Broadway production that takes her away yeah. nightly in rehearsals or what have you. You're you know flying off here, there, and everywhere for ESPN and you know covering matches and tournaments. Um, how are you guys able to to maintain that? balance because you have a very loving atmosphere a, you know close family you're always making sure the kids come first but it, it requires a lot of balance to be able to pull all that off what do you think it, is it, there a it def, secret it, it, secret sauce or no well there's no secret sauce it's it's a, you know got to be committed there's, there's been there's ups and downs no doubt you know traveling as you said for me you know melissa's like you know you, you travel all the time you know, especially 
from going to the big tournaments. So you really have to find find that balance. Um, you know, I remember one year she was doing uh, Bull Durham, the musical, which never made it to Broadway, but they were doing it in Atlanta, um, you know, a run for a couple of months. So I would go down there with all the girls, you know, we stay down there with her for a week or two at a time. So it's finding those moments. They would come to Wimbledon with me and we'd be able to rent a house there in the Wimbledon village. Um, so we, we, we find those moments. Australia has always been a very difficult trip because I would leave in the middle of January. We couldn't take the kids because it was too far and it's the middle of school. So Melissa has been an unbelievable trooper, you know, to deal yeah. with that. I think yeah. I've you know done the same when, it, but she obviously doesn't have to travel for those long periods as much as I did. Um, and back in those days. Now, listen, I don't want to interrupt this great conversation, but the kids group gym is about to end. Okay. And I want, oh, you, check guys, it out. Yeah. I want you guys to be able to see, cause it ends at eight o'clock local yeah. time. Yeah. So I want to just, and then you're going to have a bunch of adults just playing on the course. That's not nearly as fun. So, <laughs> so at tell least us, give you a little, little, tell so us where the, the Academy is located and all Patrick. It's located on Randall's Island in uh, New York. And right now I'm just looking out from our balcony. You can see we have five courts here and this, this is our highest level boys group. So these are boys ranging from about 12 years old until about 17. So we've got the, the, the kids until they go to um, go off to college. And these are mostly uh, all kids from the New York area, some of whom are, are, are scholarship kids. We raise money at a couple of events during the course of the year to uh, support some of the kids that normally can't afford it. That was a big deal for my brother when uh, he first started here and he uh, came on asked me to come on with them a few years ago when I left the USDA. So we've got a balance. I'm going to go down the stairs here. We've got some of our adults coming in, getting ready for their eight o'clock court. And now I'm going to walk out to the actual courts. How big is and, the facility? Uh, got the kids groups go from uh, in the afternoon from four to 8 PM, Jim. Uh, mm. And we also have kids that come during the day uh, that are homeschool kids. We have a group of kids that, um, homeschool or go to sort of an online school um, and they come during the day. So they're, they're like really the highest level uh, players that we have. Now I'm going into what we call our, we have two tennis bubbles here. The bubbles are about to come down. Okay. Which we're very excited about because of the weather when we keep them up. This is our high level uh, girls group now out here. They're playing some doubles. You can see them right here. Hopefully the ball won't hit me as I stand. Can you hear me okay, Jim? Oh yeah. Can you hear yeah. Me? How okay, big good. is the facility? So we so these are five of our clay courts, and this is our high level um, girls nice. courts. Nice. And we've got twenty courts overall. We've got ten hard courts and ten clay courts. This is called clay. It's a green clay, mm -hmm. and uh, the girls are finishing up playing some doubles points right now. They so they spend the first part of the two hours doing some drills. They do some singles, individual games with the other players. And we have groups of five. So that the, the, some, oh, look at, look at these girls. They're, they're killing out here. Yeah, huh? They're running around, <laughs> unbelievable energy. And we have a gym here. So these players will go to the gym either before or after their workout, depending on when it's happening. Let me go check on the other bub, which is going to be the younger kids. And uh, we have um, kids under 10 that are basically from like four to eight years old between four and 6 p.m. So this is some of our better younger boys out here. That is cool, look at that. Yeah, so it's a pretty awesome program and uh, we're we're in the process of uh, hopefully building, they got the music going out here. So I can't sing, Jim. <laughs> I know some of your, your guests, you know, just break into song like my beautiful wife. So yeah. that's gonna be a little difficult for me. Hello there. <laughs> How are you? You're on TV. Hey. Say hi. You're on TV. How's the session hey. going? Going well? It's going well. That's Today's cool. Having fun. They're working yeah. hard. Got my coach over there, Coach Jason. He was out there with me today at Central Park, uh, working with um, the ladies out there, raising money for the conservancy. This guy never. Jason, what time did you start? What, I mean, you, you teach you teaching lessons. We're on TV right here. 7 a.m. He started this morning. You got a lesson tonight? Tonight till 10 and 6.30 tomorrow. Tonight wow. till 10 o'clock. And then he starts again at 6.30 in the morning. Wow. Okay. Dedication. So you're talking dedication. <laughs> and that's with a lot of the time they spent our coaches with the scholarship kids. And 
they don't make their same rate that they make when they teach adults, right? So we all kind of work together and try to help the scholarship kids. And of course, we got to keep those coaches in business. And so, uh, we have a nice balance of a, yeah. sort of a for-profit type of business, but at the so, same time, um, helping these kids, um, you know, be able to play tennis at a high level. Now I'm walking outside here. Jim. Oh, that's nice. So it's open to the general public. You can be a part of it. Yeah, it's open to the uh, general public. It's on Randall's Island, right outside of Manhattan in New York City. Right. And the city owns Randall's Island. So it's a Randall's Island park. And they have lots of fields here where, where people... Um, you know, come and play soccer and some of the private schools or schools come and use the field for, for softball. So now we have a little outdoor area out here where the kids can do a little outdoor training. Wow. That is nice. Look at that place, huh? Which has happened a lot more. Uh, and I can run up the stairs. Look, I get my workout in. I'm running up the stairs. <laughs> we have a little stadium here. We have stands. We'll work out with Patrick. <laughs> that is really cool, huh? And we, all, we, have, we have all. Mm. All out. You know, come visit us at Andals Island, John Absolutely. Tennis Academy. And uh, it's a lot of fun. I love being out here. I love working with the kids. Cool. We'll get a little the, energy as we wrap up here. Yeah, that is awesome. The Wi-Fi is starting to get a little funky maybe where you are, probably better inside a little bit. But that is really, really cool. What a place that is, huh? Jeez. It's talking about Randall's Island in New York is where the John Macro Tennis Academy is for all ages. And uh, he's heading back inside. This is great, huh? You got a live tour. We were talking about that before we went uh, live that we might do a little quick tour of the Academy. I think when he gets set back up with the uh, Wi-Fi, because going outside, sometimes the Wi-Fi can get a little tricky. There he is, back. How are we doing now, Jim? Am <laughs> now I back? It's better. Yes, you uh, are I'm back. back inside. I'm back inside. I'm in my little office. Maybe that you was know a this great... lady. Maybe, yeah. maybe, you know, maybe you know this lady right here. Oh, yes. There she is. There's Melissa. Melissa. Erico sings, That's a great sings, shot. Sings Sondheim. That was a, what, a, what a record that was, singing the sure Sondheim record was phenomenal, so. You back, know, in my, back in my office here, it's a little different setup, but here we, we have a, a tour. You know, that was awesome. Questions? Yeah, we do have uh, Austin Field, uh, who I was telling you about, is a certified uh, professional instructor, and his family uh, comes from a real big tennis family. His, uh, I think it's his great grandfather, Jack Geller, was uh, a pro wow. that played in the U.S. Open back in the 40s and 50s. Um, he, uh, he wanted to know, he had this question about, um, you know how they're doing the electronic calls yes. now versus yep. having the live people there. Do you think that's something they're going to stick with and do you like it? Well, I think it depends on the event. In fact, that we just had a call today with us, as I mentioned earlier, with ESPN about Wimbledon. And it sounds like Wimbledon is going to use the electronic system, but also keep the lines people which doesn't surprise me because Wimbledon is, you know, they're so tied in with tradition. And so they like to keep a lot of the traditions, obviously having lines people on the court is one of those. Um, I think the U.S. Open, for example, will probably do a mix as well. It really depends on the event, but I think in a lot of the smaller events that are going on around the world, you're going to see the electronic system because it does work extremely well. Um, it's, 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 it's very accurate. Yeah. Um, and obviously in the, in the, in the days of COVID where you're just trying to keep the overall numbers of people, um, uh, lower, uh, that was sort of an, an easy decision for a lot of the smaller events, but I think it'll be interesting moving. I think you're going to see a mix essentially moving forward of the electronic system, but also some events still having some of the lines people as well. That's cool. That's cool. Um, he also asks, should they use Hawkeye for clay courts? Well, um, good question. That's come up a lot. Uh, you know, clay courts, you can see the mark. You know, the right. mar on clay courts, are, the ball leaves a pretty clear mark. I mean, sometimes you can see on the, <clears throat> on the Hawkeye that it's a little, it's, it's slightly different, but it's pretty rare. So I'm not, I'm not sure, you know, because it does cost a lot of money to yeah. install the system. So I can understand why the clay court terminus is like, you know, 
we don't really need it because it's so rare that it happens. Whereas on the other services, you know, you're just, you don't get mark on a grass court or a hard court. You don't have the same mark. Whereas on a clay court, it leaves a pretty distinctive mark. And it's pretty rare that the call from the mark is different than the call from the electronic system. Extremely rare. And I'm not sure worth the, the time and the money to make that, um, make that change. How would you say, you know, the game has changed uh, over the years in various directions from when you were playing? Uh, it seems like, uh, you know, when you watch it, they're really working their butts off. I mean, they're really, it's like the game has ramped up. It's become much more, not that it wasn't always physical, but they're really right. giving it their all. How is it, uh, how has it changed from the days when uh, you were out there doing your thing? Well, the reason I picked up this racket, Jim, is to show you that this is the reason why. Okay. And the reason is not just the racket, but the, it was first, it was a racket. Okay. Graphite and different materials other than wood okay and you can swing these a lot harder and a lot faster than old wood rackets i was looking around to see if i had one of my wood rackets which i don't my brother's actually got a couple in his office and we will actually go out sometimes and play with the wood rackets which is super fun and you can still get some power with the wood but you can't get the same amount of top spin and underspin and the other thing is the strings here this i just wrote this string today but the strings uh, grab the ball a lot tighter than it used to the old gut strings we used to use. So basically because of the technology, that means a couple of things, Jim. You can hit the ball harder, you can hit it with a lot more top spin, and you can do it much more consistently. So what does that mean? It just means the ball is traveling much faster. So right. what does that, therefore that mean? The players have to get quicker, the players have to adjust more quickly to the ball, uh, and that's what we've done. That's what right. players have done. There's, there's no doubt in my mind that if my brother grew up today, he'd be one of the top players in the world. If be, yeah. same for Bjorn Borg, um, because they would have adjusted to the equipment in the same, just like if Roger Federer grew up in the fifties or the sixties, he would have been number one in the world as well, using a wood racket. So the, the cream will always rise to the top, but there's yeah. no doubt that the, 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 the intensity of the game point in point out has changed because essentially it's just gotten much faster how about uh you know some of the current topic and conversation obviously is about everybody being vaccinated and uh making sure that everybody is and they've talked about vaccine passports and things of that nature how do you feel about all of that should everybody try to get vaccinated and make sure that everything is safe and sound well, I mean, I got my vaccine. My wife, Melissa, got her vaccine. I'm, I'm, I'm certainly generally speaking in favor of getting the vaccine, but uh, I'm well aware that there's plenty of people that, that for, for a variety of reasons, um, don't want to do that. So, I, you know, I think it's, it, it's a tricky situation, obviously, for the government of any country to get, you know, how involved do you get to mandate that, right? Obviously, you see companies, private companies, whether it's the airlines or other countries around the world or hotels or going on a cruise ship to you can see Broadway shows on a cruise ship. Does everybody need to be vaccinated to be able to do that? Uh, you know, that's I think a big, that's a huge question for all of us, isn't it, moving forward? So same in the tennis world, which is essentially like a traveling Broadway show. I mean, that's what the tennis world is. It's a community of people that play tennis at a high level and they're with their coaches and their trainers and their families. And it's a relatively small community that travels all over the world. So not only do you, do you have players tr from traveling all over, but you, they're from all over the world. So what if they come from a country that has totally different laws and right. legalities than, than our country or another country? So you're dealing with so many different backgrounds uh, but I do know that the ATP, which is the men's tour and the women's tour, the WTA, have talked about, they, they've encouraged, just like they're doing in, in any other walk of life, encouraging the players to get vaccinated for health purposes and for safety and so on. But they certainly can't force them to do that. And there have been right. players like Novak Djokovic and, um, you know, other top female players that have said, you know, they don't want to take the vaccine because for whatever reason that they don't want to take it. Um, so that may mean that maybe they don't get the same 
you, you know, set of rules and regulations that happen if they go to a tournament, that's going to be the X factor moving forward um, uh, in not just in the professional tennis world, but in, I think in the world in general. You know, where are we? I mean, yours is a great question. I don't have the answer to it. And I don't think we have the answer to it in all sorts of walks of life. Right, exactly. You mentioned female players and tennis is one of those sports where I think the opportunities are relatively equal or as close as they can be with tennis. And I know you're very supportive of women's tennis and, and women getting involved in the game, right? Well, I mean, women's tennis is uh, by far the most prolific female sport, uh, professional female sport on the planet. When you talk about overall popularity of, of the great female tennis players, how much income they can make playing tennis is by far more than any other sport. Golf is sort of close, but not nowhere. I think they did a, I think of the 10 highest paid female athletes, this was a year or two ago, I saw this uh, done, Jim, nine of them were tennis players, professional mm -hmm. tennis players. Now, I love the fact that there, you know so many other sports for girls to play now, lacrosse, soccer, basketball, obviously you see the Olympic sports like gymnastics and swimming and so on. Um, but there are none of those sports you can make kind of money you can make in tennis, which is part of the reason why in this country, I believe we have a lot more high quality female professional players than male players. Because if you're a male young kid, great athlete, tennis is not necessarily going to be your first sport. You have multiple options to do all sorts of sports. Whereas for young girls, if you have a great athlete who's five, six, seven years old and they like to compete. And the parents think, you know, oh, this could be a way for them to go to a big time college or become a pro. Uh, tennis would be the number one sport. And I think that's why we get a lot better athletes playing tennis for on the women's side than on the male side. Because if you look at the great athletes in the world now, um, play, the, you have to be a great athlete to be a top tennis player. If you're Rafael Nadal, Novak Djokovic, you know, Roger Federer, these young guys coming up. These guys are phenomenal athletes in addition to being great tennis players. So if you don't have the full package, you can't make it to the promised land as a tennis player now. Got another question that came in from Austin Field as well. Should the ATP and WTA merge? Oh, I think they should. I mean, I've been saying that for a while um, because, again, I think the package of men's and women's tennis together is, is a great package, meaning it's, it's, it's better for fans. It's better yeah. for television. It's better for sponsors. That's why the four majors, Australian Open, French Open, Wimbledon, U.S. Open, are by far, by far the biggest money makers in tennis. Okay, And it's also where the players make the most money. Um, and the other events on the tour that have become what we call combined events, which are men and women playing in the same venue, um, have also become bigger and better. So I think there's a no brainer for that to happen. And I think it would be, a, you know, tennis has always to me been a great model for, for, for putting women's women athletes <clears throat> at the forefront and playing all, sort of alongside the men in the same, you know, the U.S. Open Stadium. They don't do that in golf. You know, right. the Masters is in men and women. The U.S. Open Golf Championships is the men's event and the women's event. Well, tennis has both. And so I think that's that's. That's something that should be celebrated, and it also should be something that should be um, made it make make it even bigger. And I think Absolutely. that's the way to do it. You know, we all have mentors and people that inspire us, and uh, in the relationship with your parents, especially your dad, having an opportunity to see the success of John and and your success as well. Tell us about the relationship with uh, Senior McEnroe. Well, he was very proud. You know, as I said, he grew up, you know, basically dirt poor in New York City and sort of made himself into a, a successful attorney. Um, and, you know, my parents were were able to give us the opportunities that they didn't get, you know, going to private school, taking tennis lessons and those kind of things, playing at the Douglaston Club, for example. So he was extremely proud. I mean, to put it mildly, maybe to the point sometimes they're like, Dad, you got to chill out. You know, like yeah. John and I would play in the senior event in Paris when, you know, 20 yeah. years after this, when we were we were retired and he would he would think it was like the Wimbledon final, you know, but yeah. um, he yeah. was very proud, very proud. No doubt about it. Um, you know, we miss him. Both my parents passed away the same year, about about 40 years ago. 
They were both yeah. in their early 80s. So they had a great run. Um, but there's no doubt that uh, they, you know, they love being the McEnroe's. And uh, they were, they, you know, they, people think when they look back, they're like, oh, your dad was always at the, you know, big matches. Well, he was only at the, the finals. You know, they, they pretty much, our parents were smart. They let us do our own thing. Right. You know, they, they, they were very proud and they were involved. My dad used to take me to all the junior tennis tournaments when I was a kid, you know, that I've now done somewhat with my own daughter um, in the last couple of years. But um, when I got my license as a, you know, I guess, I guess I was 16 or 17 at the time, whenever I could get my license to drive, my mom was like, son, you're on your own. Go to the tournament by yourself, drive to the tournament you know, and they really fostered independence in us. And, and I, I remember going to Italy as a 15, 16 year old kid by myself with my buddy and, 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 and playing junior tennis tournaments, you know, traveling around on a train in Europe and, and doing it myself. So my parents, while they gave us the opportunities and they were extremely proud, you know, of their McEnroe boys uh, and all of us, my brother, Mark, too, who didn't get into the profession of tennis, um, they also kept their distance. You know, let, right. let us do our thing because right. that was our thing. Um, so I think they had a pretty good balance. There's somebody else, too, that I know was a big inspiration for you and mentor. Is it Dickie Herbst? Tell us a little bit about Dickie. Well, Dickie Herbst was one of my coaches, you know, midway through my career. He was uh, from originally from Massachusetts, and uh, he's still a great friend of mine um, and just a great person. And you know, I met him through one of my great co college buddies, the Palangian family. Paul Palangian was the best man at the wedding for me and Melissa. And Dickie um, coached those, him and his brother. And those guys played at Harvard. They were good players, but they weren't like top level type pro professional players. But I, I just kind of meshed with Dickie. And so he, he really helped me when I was in my mid late twenties. And I never had a real good run at the U.S. Open. It was always that tournament I really wanted to do well because that was my hometown. And so he started working with me the year before that. And he started making me practice with better players. And he started making me like believe in myself more. Right. You know, and I remember he, 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 he tried to hit, make me hit the ball bigger, you know, hit the, take more chances because I was a pretty conservative type player, more of a counter puncher. And right. I, I'll never forget, I played Boris Becker in the quarterfinals of the U.S. Open. I was down two sets to love. And I was playing about as well as I could play. I mean, Boris Becker, was, I'd beaten him a few times, but he, basically he was better than me. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, Dickie told me, he's like, play bigger. Like, go for more. Take more chances. I said, what the, what the hell do I have to lose? I'm <laughs> playing center court at the U.S. Open. I'm down two sets to love. I'm playing well. And so I just... I ramped it up and believe it or not, I, I won the next set and I had set points to win the force. I ended up losing it in the force. It was a four hour, 15 minute match. It was one of those great New York city moments like matches at the U S it started in the day, it went to the evening. And in a lot of ways, that's one of my most proud matches, even though I lost it because I, I sat there and I said, you know, I gotta, I gotta go for it, man. You gotta just go for it. So right. Dickey was somebody that really helped me find that part of myself that maybe I didn't know was there, you know, and he kind of saw it and he's like, you know, we, we got to bring this out. How did you come up with hello? <laughs> <laughs> Funny. I was saying it. One of the kids today was uh, he hit an ace and he looked at me, he goes, hello. He yeah. goes, why don't you say, hello? I said, I don't say it on an ace. Yeah. Okay. I, don't, I only say it when it's a spectacular shot. And I said, and by the way, you don't say it just any time, okay? You have to say when it's something special. And then I, I looked, and this kid is, he's one of our better players. And he's always like, Patrick, you know, what should I serve here? You know, he's, he's always trying to like, you know, work me a little bit. I'm like, I said, I don't know. You tell me where you're going to serve now. I said, you know, like, you, it's time for you to take over. You know what I mean? Like when you're out there as a tennis player, you got to, it's time for you to step up. Right. Like you got to do it. You know, don't look at me. I mean, he's kind of playing around, but I, I saw it as a moment to like teach him something, you right. know, like it's time for you to believe in yourself and start doing it yourself. And I say, I don't know where hello. Came, I don't know where it came from, Jim. It was just because I love watching the game. I think it maybe 
because I, you know, especially when Federer was younger and you're watching him hit all these like ridiculous shots, you're like, hello, like where, yeah. where does that yeah. come from? Right. Um, so I, I try to sprinkle them in, but again, I try not, as I said to the kid, I said, sometimes less is more. Exactly. Uh, who are some players that you have your eye on, some younger players that are coming up the ranks that look really good to you? Well, unfortunately, most of them continue to be European, at least on the men's yeah. side. Uh, Yannick well, Sinner from Why Italy do you think is, that is, too? Uh, what is it about uh, the, the America? Because they're better not, athletes. Yeah. I, just, I, I sort of, in my earlier answer, because they, yeah. they get this kid, Sinner, was yeah. like a world-class skier until he was 11 or 12. And then he, right. then he, then he, then he went full on in tennis. We have, we do have a couple of good young kids. Coming up. Sebastian Corda, whose dad was Peter Corda. Right. He played at the same time as me. And he, he actually won the Australian open. Um, and he's a, was originally from the, what was then Czechoslovakia, then became Czech the Czech Republic. Republic. Right. And his right. wife was also a professional tennis player. And he has other daughters that are, they, they, they stayed in Florida. Right. After they um, got married, they lived in Florida, so their kids are American, but they have a you know amazing tennis background. Sebastian is is doing great. I think he's our best young American hope at the moment. We've got a few so really solid players like Francis Tiafo and Taylor Fritz and Riley Opelka, who's like six eleven, who I think could be great if he could if he could get a little bit tougher, a little bit physically and mentally tougher. Um, but the truth is the most talented young players at the moment overall are the European guys. Sinner, Musetti is another Italian. They're starting to create some really good players. Um, Sitsipas, the guy from Greece who just beat yep. – uh, who had a great match from Nadal. He won saw that, yeah. Carlo. You know, uh, you got some other Russians coming up like Rublev who beat Nadal on clay. Um, but – you know, I'm optimistic, but again, Europe is the center of, of men's tennis. On the women's side, we continue to have a lot of great young female players. Coco Goff, um, you know, CC Bellis a couple of years ago, Jen Brady, who got the great run in Australia, who played at UCLA, which is very unusual to see um, college players for women's tennis because most of the great women players start playing on the tour at like 15 or 16. So I'm actually really happy to see Jen Brady become mm. a top female player having spent a couple of years at UCLA. Um, I think that's a great avenue. In fact, that's where we want what most of our kids here at our academy to do, which is go get a scholarship, play at a big time college if you're good enough in tennis, and then see where that takes you. Uh, some people have said that Carlos Alcaraz might be sort of the oh, next. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Raf no, no, Rafael and Nadal. Yeah. He might be another Rafa. You think so? Well, that's that's like saying there's gonna be another Serena. <laughs> you know, that's, yeah. that's asking much. But Alcaraz yeah. is, is really good. He's 17, as you said, the first 17 year old on the male side to be even playing at that level is remarkable because of the physicality of the game. It's gotten so much better and stronger. So the fact that he's even doing that is is remarkable. So I put him absolutely at the top of that list as well. The couple of young Canadian guys have done great too. Shapovalov whose par yeah, parents, yeah. his mom's Russian, of Russian descent, emigrated to Canada, and OJ Ali Yassin. Both those guys have a lot of physical tools, great athletes, happen to get into tennis in Canada, uh, which is unusual because they don't have a great tennis tradition. Um, but those two young guys are really, really good. And uh, I think they're capable of, 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 going the, of going all the way. Obviously, you've still got Nadal there, Djokovic. Hopefully, Federer will come back and be able to play some this summer at Wimbledon and the U.S. Open and so on, and he can still get back in there. But a little bit questionable at the moment, his recovery from the knee, knee surgery. Any thoughts on uh, no Novak starting the Professional Tennis Players Association? Will that create a rift with the ATP Tour? That's already created a rift. There's already a rift going on, but I think that they're working through it. The bottom line is the tennis players can't get their act together because there's no real union in tennis. Right. There's no, right. you know, there's a, it's a tournament uh, and, the ter and the players, which worked for a time because it helped grow the tour, the ATP tour. But in a way, the only real power the players have, okay, is if they come together. Right. That's the only. Otherwise, they're they're just they're pawns essentially, which is basically what's happened. And there's too big a, a a gap, in my opinion, between what the top top players make in tennis, which is huge, 
and the run of the mill players, you know, the run of the mill tennis players don't make that much money. Okay. They, they do well, but when you, when you have to think about all the expenses they have, the coaches, the travel, the fitness people. So if you see a player, for example, who makes $750,000, which is a lot. Okay. That's mm. a lot. The truth is that they're actually bringing at the end of the day, at the end of the, they're lucky to make half of that. Right. I mean, for the, for the course of a year, lucky to make that. It, they could be like 50, 60 and the, you know, one of the best in the world. So tennis is not it, what the pandemic has done for me, to me in a positive way is the prize money distribution has changed a bit because of the pandemic. Cause most of the tournaments now have way less prize money because I, what I told you about the fact that the tournaments aren't bringing in nearly the same revenue because there's no right. ticket sales. So right. instead of uh, the top player making, you know, 4 million and the second place player making 2 million and then 1 million down, you know, now you're seeing, okay, 1 million to the winner. I'm throwing out a number just for percentage sake, you know, 780 to second place, 675 for third place. That's how golf does it. It's more evenly distributed from number one to number 50. And I think that tennis should do that. And I, I don't, I, the top players make way more money in endorsements and in guaranteed contracts and things like that that they deserve because they bring in most of the tick of the fans. But I think the distribution of prize money should be evened out a little bit. There's a player that Juanita was asking about. She's in South Africa. She said, any thoughts on Lloyd Harris from Cape Town, South Africa? Well, he's done really well this year. I mean, he's pretty athletic. I think I, I, I called one of his – I think he played Federer last year at Wimbledon, and he was sort of what we call a challenger player, like he wasn't at the main tour. But he's picked it up big time in the last six months, especially in the last few months. He's done really well. He's a tall guy. He's lanky. He's pretty athletic. And uh, I love what I'm seeing from him. South Africa used to have a lot of players. You know, I right. played with Wayne Ferreira. Um, you know, there are quite a few Gary Muller. There are a lot of like really solid players from South Africa. Then that tailed off. Um, now you've got Kevin Anderson, who made a couple of Grand Slam finals, who played college tennis also in the United States. Um, and now Lloyd Harris as well. So they've got a few players starting to happen. I'd like to see some female players come from South Africa because we haven't seen many of those for a while. So do you still play? Do you still uh, toss it around with your brother here and there? I got all my rackets. Look at all these rackets. Are you kidding me? I got all my rackets. <laughs> I'm ready. I got to play with. I got to play with the kids. I got to play with my daughter. I got to play with my brother. Um, so yes, and I'm actually teaching a lot, which I really you, enjoy. I got the ball. If you're ready, <laughs> you got. Oh, let's go. We're having so a ball. I, I, I play. I got. Look, I got my snacks here in case I need. Got my nuts. You know, I'm trying to eat well here, Jim. I'm trying to stay healthy. Um, so. I, I mean, do I go out and I don't play for myself that much right, anymore. Right. You know, I play for the kids and for the people I'm giving lessons to um, uh, with my daughter, as I said. So I would like to actually play a little bit more for myself because I, I love it. So actually, yeah. my brother was had just been in California, so he just came back today. So that's why he surprised us when we were upstairs. So, yeah, yes, he cool. and I will get out and play. Um, because it's very good for the mind still to keep playing, uh, to hit that ball. I don't really care about competing that much at this stage of my life, um, but I love to go out and hit the ball and hit it well, which is something I can still do. I can't run particularly fast to get to the ball, but if the ball's to me, I can still hit it pretty well. And one of the nice things that we've been able to do, my brother and I, in the last 10 years is when we go to Wimbledon or the U.S. Open, Australia, we get to play in – you know, I call it the old guys uh, tournament. They call it the Le Le Legend in Paris. You know, they would come up with nice names um, and we go out and play. And, the, you know, the, it's nice for the fans to see some of the old timers. It's good for us. It gets us out there, keeps us in shape. And um, so that's something obviously because of COVID is not happening right now. So hopefully in another year or so, tennis gets back to normal. One of the real pleasures of my life in, in my broadcasting years has been to go out after a day of broadcast and go out at Wimbledon and actually play, play mm. a match. You yeah. know, we play for fun. We don't make it like real competitive because you're playing with other guys, you know, from Sweden and France and you know, guys that we played with on a tour. So we like to go out and have a good time and do some trick shots between the legs and, you know, entertain the fans. Mm. That's really cool. 
Uh, my buddy Austin Field here says, I would love to hit with you, even if it's $500 an hour. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a little bit less there, but you know, you got to pay a pretty penny to get a lesson with me here. But for you, maybe I'll give you a deal. That is cool. He's probably yeah. jumping up and down in the living room. Yeah. What what else is on your bucket list? I mean, you, you've there's so many things that you've done uh, and that you continue to do. And as I said at the top, Patrick, you and your brother, your family, Melissa, everybody, but you specifically, um, you're a terrific broadcaster. You're very polished. You're very smooth. You and John razz each other. You play off each other beautifully. It's a great yin and yang with the personalities, but you also complement each other beautifully as well. Uh, so from the broadcasting side, you're, you're a true professional, a class act. You're very good at what you do. You're mild mannered, still passionate and enthusiastic about it. What are some other things that are on the Patrick McEnroe bucket list that you still would like to do? Well, I love I love doing the broadcasting. And as you said, I, I love to do the multiple roles dealing with and doing different things. Um, the podcast has been a great outlet for me because I love doing my own radio show. Um, so the podcast is a way for me to, to not just talk sports, but to interview like the Kristen Chenoweth of the world, to interview um, uh, other athletes from other sports and just people from all different backgrounds, writers, journalists. I've done that as well. So I really love that. That that That's something I'm very passionate about. So I'm going to continue to do that. I like to grow that. Um, yeah. on, the, on the TV side, you know, doing the tennis is, is kind of in my wheelhouse. So I hope I can continue doing that for many, many years. And also just, you know, being around the kids at the academy. And and it's it's been actually amazing because this job had actually been on the court a lot more than I than I was when I worked for the USDA, for example. And uh, just to be out there helping kids and, and even helping adults, you know, just enjoying the game um, has been amazing. So I think the podcast for me is a, kind of the one thing I like to continue to grow. And, and maybe that turns into something bigger down the road. Uh, if not, you know, I love doing it because it's fun for me. And, and I think I do a pretty good job at it. Austin, oh, absolutely, you sure do. Austin Field says, thank you, Patrick. And LD says, have always enjoyed Patrick on ESPN and love when he and John broadcast together. Great guys. I, I second that, uh, LD. You mentioned um, your daughter is also playing as well. Um, tell us a little bit about her and uh, how that's working. Well, she's she's an amazing person and yeah. a great student, number one, which is the most important. And she, uh, unfortunately, has had some injuries in the last couple of years, which have been really difficult for her, back injury. And then that she recovered from pretty quickly when she was just 12. She's 15. She just turned 15. Um, and the last couple of years, she's had a really serious ankle problem that she hasn't been able to get rid of. So one of the kids that was out there on the top girls group was my daughter. I, of course, I would not embarrass her. So she's kind of getting back to 100% health because she really hasn't been able to compete at the level she was at as a 12-year-old in the last couple of years. So she's looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to her being able to play with no, like, dad, my ankle hurts. Dad, why does my ankle hurt? Dad, why do you keep saying my ankle's going to get better? It's not. So she actually had to have surgery on the ankle a few months ago, and it looks like that's finally fixed the problem. So now she's just kind of getting back into the groove, and I just want to see her enjoying her tennis, um, being able to compete like the way she likes to compete, um, and have that be a part of her you know, next couple of years as she gets ready to go to college. She's in ninth grade and uh, really, as I said, a great student. And uh, it's fun for me to have her around. She actually came in while we were chatting because yeah. she has on online class at 8 p.m. that she's doing from her computer right now, waiting for us to finish because she does online uh, school during this past year, uh, which gives her a little more flexibility. So, we, you know, she comes with me pretty much here all day at the academy and, and does her thing. That is cool. Uh, Austin had one last question here. I guess sort of like a prediction. Who will have the most majors, Federer, uh, Djokovic, or Nadal? You know. <laughs> you have that crystal a, ball? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I wish I did. If I had to bet, I'd say Djokovic because he's a little bit younger. And, um, you know, he's also – he's a favorite basically in every service except clay. You know, obviously Nadal yeah. is still the favorite to French Open. But you, the three of the four majors are played on a hard court of grass, two on hard, one on grass. 
And right now, if you tell me any of those three were starting tomorrow, I would say Djokovic is the favorite. And he's a year younger. So if you if he stays healthy and the motivation stays there, which I believe it will, because he wants desperately to, to be the guy with the most, uh, it'd be hard to bet against him. I mean, obviously, Nadal you, is still the favorite of the friend, certainly this year, and you'd think at least another year or two. Um, but Djokovic, as I said, the favorite on the others. Are, we're all hoping Federer can come back and play at a high level. Um, I would never say that he can't win another one because you, I never underestimate greatness, uh, even though you get older and, you know, you slow down, but he's like a marvel that it, he's yeah. 40. And, you know, even in his late thirties, he was winning, winning a couple of majors. Um, but the players, those guys, the reason they're able to play, continue to play at this level, Jim, obviously genetically they're freaks, they're gifted as players, but they've been able to take care of themselves a lot better over the years with their teams, with their management load, with their 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 nutrition, their recovery, um, so they're still playing in a very. It used to be when you hit thirty, it was like you were done as a professional. Even, even Serena on the women's side, Venus, who's in her forty, are still playing at a very high level. So I, we all hope in the tennis world that Federer can come back and give it one more great shot. But the longer he stays out, um, he's been out. You know, the more difficult it comes when it, it will be for him to come back and win another one. Before we go, one last uh, question here. And again, I don't call these interviews. I call these conversations, uh, Patrick. What are some of those blessings and joys in your own life personally that continue to, you know, foster this passion and enthusiasm that you have for not only tennis, but also broadcasting, communicating, and constantly being a uh, lifelong learner and paying it forward as you have, your brother has, and um, obviously Melissa does it as well, but for you specifically, some of those blessings that really continue to well, inspire you. Well, I'm incredibly blessed by my family, number one, you know, by Melissa, yeah. who is incredible, by my kids <clears throat> and us working together, you know, for the, for the betterment of the family, number one. Number two, as I said earlier, you know, and I, I, I remind Melissa this all the time, we're very lucky that we've been able to pursue our passion and yeah. make our passion a career. And yes, of course, it has ups and downs um, throughout, you know, your, your entire uh, career. Uh, but I, I told Melissa 20 some years ago, I said, baby, I said, your best years are going to be your 50s and 60s. I think I might have to add 70s and 80s. I'm not sure I'll yeah, still be around yeah. then, Jim. That's but up that. <laughs> I, I really feel like, like that about her that, you know, she's, you know, just growing, getting better, writing, you know, doing her, her own show, just all the things she does that she's passionate about. And for me, same, like, you know, I've been, as I said, I, I love tennis and I love the fact that I can keep making a living being in the tennis world, but I also love to kind of, you know, nudge myself in these different, without going crazy. It's not like I'm trying to become a rocket scientist, you know, become a singer or, you know, a great piano player, but, but I'm trying to sort of, it was still within my comfort zone, push myself in different areas. And uh, again, I, I just love it. I enjoy it. I love doing it. I get a real kick out of doing a great podcast with Dean Carnassus, who's the ultra marathon guy. He's one of my guests yeah. this season. You know, hearing his story and hearing his passion, you know, how he got into running, why he did it. Right. Um, those kind of things are what, what keep me going. Well, I tell you, uh, blessed situation. And again, none of it uh, always comes easy. It always looks easier than it is. But uh, you're a great role model uh, for many, Patrick, and uh, for your family and uh, for those of us in the broadcasting industry. And uh, I just wish you nothing but continued success uh, and joy in your life for you and Melissa and uh, the entire family. This was awesome. This was great. We uh, got a chance to really touch upon a lot of different things and hopefully people got a deeper understanding of what makes Patrick McEnroe tick, whether he's the broadcaster or, you know, the tennis player, whatever it may be. This was uh, a nice dive deeper than uh, just a typical conversation and show you some of the levity coming your way here. Thank you, Patrick, for such an informative <laughs> evening. It was very interesting for me. That's Ann and, uh, Florida, Juanita in South Africa. This was a great conversation. Thank you, Patrick, for your time and for the tour as well. Keep well. And uh, 
Maureen in Arizona, it has been fun hearing your stories, Patrick. The tennis world is lucky to have such legends as you and John. Keep living your passion. And Mary Bishop of Florida says, thank you so much, Patrick. I really enjoyed it. This was terrific, my friend. You're welcome back anytime. We'll keep the porch light on for you. And I really hope that the show <laughs> met whatever expectations that you had and you enjoyed the time with me as much as I certainly have with you, my friend. Uh, Jim, you're, you're an absolute pro and you're a pleasure to be on with. And uh, I'm just amazed that you do this every night. I mean, it's awesome. So you keep doing what you're doing. I know you're passionate about it. You do an awesome job. And uh, I feel it's official, right? I'm a lovity. That's what they said. <laughs> yeah, I love it. You, I, lo you I, made are, it. I made it to you, the big time, baby. You made it to the big time. You yeah. won the French Open. You're a lovity. I mean. <laughs> yeah. What more is there to do now? I got to keep pushing forwards, Jim. <laughs> Austin Fields says, thank you, Patrick, for answering all of my questions. Loved it. No You're problem. a class act, my friend, class act, and uh, we'll let you go do your thing. But uh, thanks for joining us, my friend. It was a real pleasure, and thanks for all of the, the time with us tonight. And yep. hope to see you again in uh, another opportunity, maybe in person. That'd be cool. That'd be great. See you down the road. Thanks, everybody, and uh, keep up the good work. See you soon. Thanks. Take care and say hi to Take Melissa care. for Bye -bye. us. Bye-bye. You got Bye. it. Thanks for joining us, Patrick McEnroe. He was amazing. And Kathy Schwartz says, uh, wonderful conversation tonight. Thanks for sharing your time with us. Uh, he was terrific. And uh, Jennifer Barry says, uh, thank you, Patrick. And uh, again, maybe you're learning about some of his uh, activities for the first time. Again, there is that great shot with his brother, John, John McEnroe, of course. And uh, we talked a little bit about this. And that just is an awesome shot. It really, really is. And uh, so are some of the other ones that we showed you, like this one here with uh, Melissa and the girls. And um, again, uh, balance is what it's all about, right, gang? We talk about that a lot. There is uh, Patrick McEnroe and his brother, John McEnroe, on set there. And uh, we uh, thank the folks at ESPN for that photo. And... Uh, couple of others that we were taking a look at here doing their thing. Now, when you uh, watch ESPN and you see Patrick and you see John, you've got a little bit more of an inside uh, understanding of the work that goes into it. What was also really, really cool was that uh, impromptu ad hoc tour that we went on of the John McEnroe Tennis Academy there on Randall's Island in New York City. If you or somebody you know is interested in finding out more about that, you should check it out online. It really is a state of the art facility. It really is a very, very cool place. And uh, it was really cool to see some of the, uh, some of the folks there that were actually practicing and uh, getting lessons as we speak. And there's the family, Melissa and John, uh, Melissa and Patrick that is, and John, um, his brother of course uh, popped in. Did you see that? Did you see when John popped in? Um, that was John McEnroe that popped in behind Patrick when Patrick was chatting. But there's Patrick and Melissa and the girls. Great shot too on the courts, John and Patrick. Just a few shots we have here as we were chatting and there's, um, there he is as well. And uh, this was just a really cool conversation. And there is Patrick and Melissa. Melissa, again, you may remember, was a guest on the Gym Master Show Live, uh, Melissa Arico, and she's an amazing Broadway star and Broadway talent. And it was awesome having her. Fantastic people we have here. Great, great guests, great guests. And uh, good stuff, loved it. And thanks for all the questions. We tried to get to as many of them as we can. Uh, sometimes we can't get to everything because there's so many elements to our show and so many things going on. But uh, it was really cool having this conversation with Patrick and hope you guys uh, enjoyed it. And we have something very special tomorrow too. Tomorrow, we have somebody live and direct from California, Farmer Ken. This is a terrific green thumb, an amazing gardener who's doing something really special. Uh, he has created these incredible community gardens in and around the Los Angeles, California area. And he is uh, well known as Farmer Ken. And he has some amazing stories. He's going to show us a lot of cool things tomorrow on the Gym Masters Show Live. So join us tomorrow as Kenneth Sparks, 
farmer can. If you have a green thumb, you like landscaping, you like gardening, you like flowers, you like vegetables, wait till you hear what he did. He has taken uh, vacant lots and sort of blighted areas and turned them into really works of art, uh, community gardens that are extraordinary. And he's been featured on television. He's been in magazines and covered in national newspapers and more. He is amazing. He's all excited. He's going to be here coming up on Thursday's show. And we're really, really looking forward to that. And on Friday, we've got another incredible actor and singer, uh, film, television, Broadway, and so much more. Uh, Jack Mulcahy, Mulcahy is going to be with us. Jack Mulcahy is going to be with us on Friday. We're excited about that. Then coming up on uh, Saturday, we have uh, Mike Shevick. He is going to be here. He's a brilliant author. He's going to be here on Saturday. And then on Sunday, live from Ireland, this is Rosa O'Reilly. She is the cousin of Keith Harkin from Celtic Thunder, uh, originally Celtic Thunder. He has his own uh, brilliant solo career now. Also, uh, she is the cousin of Rebecca Harkin. Remember, they were both guests on our show here on the Gym Master Show Live. Rosa is 14 years old. She's a brilliant singer and songwriter and musician. She is a bundle of energy. She's all excited. And she's going to be here on Sunday afternoon with us here on the Gym Master Show Live. And then Sunday night, Savella is going to be here live with great music and conversation. You may remember she was on our show previously. She is Marlene Angelitis. She was on several months back. Now she goes by Savella and she has some cool new music she's going to share with us coming up on Sunday. And then on Monday, Canadian actor and singer and uh, Broadway veteran and so much more. Ryan Silverman is going to be with us on Monday. And then actor, singer, producer, writer, Giles Howe is going to be with us on uh, Tuesday. <laughs> we have so many great guests that are uh, joining us. And, uh, and then we have another Broadway star, Jason Gray, is going to be with us next Wednesday. Um, then we have on Thursday, known as the Aussie crooner, originally from Australia and uh, lives in Nashville. Uh, you've probably seen him comment from time to time on the Gym Master Show Live. He's a prolific singer and entertainer. Marty Thompson is going to be with us live from Nashville next week. Again, they call him the Aussie crooner. He has sung with uh, the big band, uh, the BBC, big band and many big bands and orchestras and on cruise ships and all over the place. He is amazing. That's just some of the guests that are joining us here on the Gym Masters Show Live. We thank our very special guest tonight, Patrick McEnroe. We thank him very much for all the time, the great conversation. He was very open and authentic and really shared some really cool things with us, really cool things. Um, this was a fun episode with Patrick. Thanks, Jim. Looking forward to Farmer Ken. Yeah, we're going to have a good time with Farmer Ken tomorrow. Uh, again, thanks very much to Patrick McEnroe. Thanks for that cool tour as well. That was really, really a lot of fun. And a couple more comments coming in here. We're going to wrap up. Uh, please send a farmer Ken to Arizona. My backyard needs him desperately. He's amazing what he can do with a blank slate. Um, he's very excited. You're going to, it's going to be a great show. As you know, we do something different for every single episode of our uh, broadcast series, something different, something for everybody, right? So this was a blast. Uh, you got a little tennis talk and broadcast talk as well. And um, and his new podcast, which is really cool too. We wish him great success with that, Patrick McEnroe. And we thank him very much for joining us here on the show. Uh, Lisa Kelly is going to be joining us in May from uh, originally from Celtic Woman, wonderful Irish soprano. She has a vocal. Speaking of academies, she's got a wonderful vocal academy in Georgia in the United States uh, as well. Gang, as we always say, uh, don't forget to smile, share the smile with the world. That's a cool thing to do. What the heck, why not? Better to smile than frown, right? Share the lovity, a word that just happened to develop here on the show. Find your Zen place, mine is the ocean. Of course, uh, number one is always with loving family and friends. And then uh, 
I enjoy tennis too. I love to play tennis and uh, I'm certainly not a McEnroe, but uh, I do enjoy it and it's great exercise. And also cycling I love too and swimming and uh, music and writing and producing. So find your Zen place. Mine is uh, the ocean, that's the Atlantic. And of course, uh, my work in television and radio um, all these years as a broadcaster and host and stage work and everything else. Do what you love, love what you do. As you can see, Patrick is very passionate about his family, about uh, tennis, about his career in broadcasting and about life. And that's what it's all about. And um, again, great source of inspiration tonight for many watching. And uh, Maureen says, it's a struggle to keep things alive in the desert, but I keep trying. My backyard is my favorite room in my house, so I hang out there a lot, except in the summer heat. <laughs> You'll probably learn something when Kenneth Sparks, Farmer Ken, joins us tomorrow, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, live. Uh, Marsha Lyon, thanks for watching, Marsha. Hope you enjoyed the episode, my friend in Massachusetts. Good night, Jim and Lovities. Good night to Marsha. And Christine Clifton in North Carolina, thanks for another interesting show with Patrick. He had great stories and that fabulous tour. See you all tomorrow. Good night, Jim and Lovity Tribe. Get ready. Get your gardening questions, folks, because Farmer Ken is with us tomorrow. It's going to be great. I have a green thumb. Uh, I've always had a green thumb and uh, have great success out in the yard. And so if you have any questions, prepare them and uh, shoot. We will be here tomorrow. Shoot us with some questions. Jim, this was an amazing evening. Thank you and good night all. You as well. You as well to Anne in Florida and Mary Bishop in Florida. Good night, everyone. Take care. And uh, we're, again, we're going to have a great show tomorrow. And this was a fun episode with Patrick. Thanks, Jim. Looking forward to Farmer Ken. Absolutely. You guys are the best. Thanks for joining us, everybody. We appreciate you, as we always say, when I remember. <laughs> uh, love one another. Love yourself. Take care of yourself. And uh, count your blessings. Something we We've all had to do over the last uh, year or so, right? With everything we've been dealing with. And everybody's welcome to the Gym Master Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Talk Show Series. We have a good time. And uh, tonight, we had a ball. Yeah, that tennis ball. We had a ball tonight with all of you and with Patrick. We're going to sign off. Um, don't forget, the Gym Master Show Live comes to you 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, live. If you've missed any episodes of our series, well, all you have to do is stay right there on YouTube, 24-7, 365. All the episodes are there. And uh, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Those of you who have, we thank you very much. If you haven't, make sure you do and click the notification bell so you don't miss any of the amazing episodes of JMS Live plus other special treats and Fun stuff we have on that uh, channel, Jim Masters TV, and that is at YouTube. So again, thanks again for joining us tonight. We had an awesome time. A couple more comments, and then we shall head out the door. Maureen says, uh, good night, Jim, and love these everywhere. May your dreams be sweet. Thank you, Maureen, and uh, good night, everyone from Juanita. This is your host, Jim Masters, thanking you for your time this time. Till next time, one more time. We thank our very special guest, Patrick McEnroe, for joining us tonight on the Jim Masters Show Live. Class act, great guy, and uh, a real pleasure to chat with and hope to have him back soon. And um, we shall be back tomorrow with Farmer Ken and many more guests coming up. You guys are the best. Continue to tag and share and celebrate the show. It's all here for you to entertain, inform, and uh, put some smiles on your faces too, right? Can't go wrong with that. You're the best. I really appreciate all of the warmth and uh, the comments, the posts, the, the messages. It really, really means a great deal, gang. And one of the reasons why we continue to do this show uh, for all of you. So we thank you very much for all of that. You guys have a great rest of your day, great night, whatever it may be time-wise for you. And uh, we'll see you again on the next one. We're back tomorrow, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, right here on the Gym Masters Show Live. Till then. Thanks for your time. We'll see you again soon. Good night.